Hello everyone and welcome to another book vlog. I'm Tracy Harding and today I'm talking to you about the sixth book in the Ancient Future series and it's called The Cosmic Logos. There it is. Um, this was the book that I thought was completing the series. I thought, okay, six books, that's got to do it. And the way I thought I would do it is that I'll have the two main characters ascend out of this universe. How could they possibly come back after that? Well, yeah, there's more than one universe. Okay, but anyway, so Cosmic Logos, yes, it was published in 2002. It is available on ebook. It was only recently published on ebook in the last few years. Um, and uh, it's, no, I don't know, sorry. It, it's been out on ebook for, I don't know, 10 years. Um, it's only been recently published on audio in the last couple of years through Belinda Audio. And we'll have an ex excerpt from that audio book later on in this video. So I also might mention that this book and the covers for all these first six books in the Ancient Future series were all done by my partner at the time, David Harding, while using 3D graphics, um, which is why they've got the depth that they have. Um, like we certainly had a vision for these, the covers of these books, and um, he pulled them off really beautifully, exactly as I pictured, like certain scenes from the book. Um, now the concept for this one, where did the concept come from? Well, the concept was to finish the trilogy <laughs> and um, not only did we see uh, Melwin and Tori ascending, this was about, um, you know, bringing the, the Nephilim through to that point as well, like actually bringing them uh, with us um, and seeing them ascend and the other human tribes and everybody kind of coming together to... Um, make it work. Um, so this book was really about um, the spiritual journey, the final spiritual journey of the characters, winning that war of the self against the self. And we actually meet some of the Grigori counterparts that then have a big role to play um, later on in the, the other trilogies that follow this. In the beginning, if there was a beginning, the rays of the central fire went in every direction into fathomless, pure space. And gradually, the points of these rays hardened, condensed, materialized, and became atoms in space, hung from the strings of the rays. An atom is a dance of rays in which the rays try to lock, to imprison a spark of the living fire and bring it into denser manifestation by building walls around it from their very essence. That's a piece from one of my research books for this book called The Legend of Sambala, which was, is absolutely it's poetry all the way through like if you can see it's all kind of written in um in verse and so yeah it's just beautiful so yes i would highly recommend this one if you can find it it's by Torkum saradarian and uh, I found it very insp inspirational just to read because it's just, like I said, it's just poetry. It's beautiful. Um, and a lot of the books that I researched for this book, because a lot of them were about the, the 12 rays of life. I mean, sorry, the seven rays of life. And, um, yeah, there's just been so many beautiful books written about them, not the least of which were written by Alice Bailey. Now, later on in this vlog I'm actually doing a piece on the seven rays and all that information was taken from the seven rays of life by Alice Bailey who, which is just absolutely gorgeous you'll read some quotes 
in that piece and you will understand what I mean. She just writes so beautifully. And another couple of her books that I used to research this one was um, The Seventh Ray, Revealer of the New Age, and um, Intuition, Human and Solar, and uh, all by Alice Bailey. Fantastic. Um, another book which was really interesting uh, reading for this one was uh, the Shambhala Impacts. And I go into Shambhala in the story. I have a couple of characters that visit Shambhala and the whole ritual. There is um, a, a Shambhala celebration that takes place every year in Tibet and on Mount Shasta in California. Also for this book I used The Secret Doctrine by Blavatsky as I did with the previous books. This one um, inspired one of the poems that was in the books, um, You Are That Angel, blah blah blah. She formed the Theosophical Society so there is no greater um, scholar when it comes to theosophical text than Blavatsky so you can't beat her. If you want to go to the source, she's the source. Um, also um, the Encyclopedia of Angels came in handy for this one. <laughs> um, this is a gorgeous little book too, especially for those that view that are into angels. And the other book that I use for the more demon-y types is The Lesser Book of Solomon. Now this is a really um, interesting text. It's very old um, and it's got a whole lot of um, seals and kind of esoteric, deeply esoteric information in it. Um, for summoning um, demons and angels um, and it was so funny because later on I think it was in uh, Eternity Gate um, I was doing some research and um, I kept coming back to the the Lesser Book of Solomon in the research online and then I thought hey hold on a minute I think I've got that in my library somewhere and it's a really obscure text um, to have but yeah there it was sitting in my library so yes that does come in handy later in the books as well so they're the books that influenced the research there were some others as well that I just couldn't find offhand um, I have them somewhere but um, they're all listed in the back of the book Again this month I'm kind of combining the underlying themes with the reader questions because they kind of go together. Um, I had a question from Jamie. Um, did you have an inkling of the connection between Tori and Mahord from the beginning of the series? Actually no because I never knew we were going to get this far when I started writing The Ancient Future I thought it was a short story. Um, but as time went on um, I suppose as I learned about polarity, it kind of demanded that your greatest hero is also going to be the greatest adversary. And I think that's how I actually came to that conclusion and how the story unfolded. Because, um, yeah, and she, and she seemed to have a real, you know, um, gripe with Tori and Melwyn in particular. And there had to be a reason for that. And their karma was all bound up together. So it just sort of stood to reason that, yeah, Mahord was going to be, um, you know, everybody's going to have an incarnation that was them at their worst. And we discovered Noah's in this one. I mean, Noah has always just been the most gorgeous, the sweetest, you know, Selwyn and, you know, all the Ring Balin and... Um, and Fen Gong and all those beautiful characters that we've seen him be. And in this one, 
yeah, we got to see his evil side. Um, so, you know, there is that polarity within every human being and that potential to go one way or the other. So I think, yeah, that really answers that question. Um, another question that I had, um, one of the underlying themes of this book was the rays. And I had a question from Gavin and um, it was, he wanted to know more about the process I went through bringing together so many different doctrines, which wasn't difficult because really the Theosophical Society did that for me. That was their whole, that was their jam, you know, was, you know, taking Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Catholicism, um, even Hinduism, like, um, sorry, um, the Muslim faith, everything is in Theosophical doctrine. But he asked particularly about the rays. Now, as I said previously, Alice Bailey is the woman you're looking for because you said you hadn't been able to find books. Um, there wasn't many authors that wrote about the race. Alice Bailey, go to the Adiar bookstore, look for Alice Bailey. She did a lot of work on the race. This book in particular is brilliant. Um, the Shambhala Impacts also has a lot of work on the race and um, that other, this beautiful one that, uh, what's this one, The Legend of Shambhala. Um, also has a lot of reference to the rays. Like Shambhala and the rays are kind of um, intrinsic, intrinsically bound up together. So if you're looking at any books about Shambhala, the place, um, then you will probably find information about the rays also. But um, uh, for those people that are not really familiar with the rays or they forget or they weren't quite clear at the time, I have prepared a um, a bit of a, um, a doco on the race, a bit of a piece, so um, here it is. A ray is a name for a particular force or type of energy with an emphasis upon the quality which that force exhibits. The seven rays have been equated to the seven spirits before the throne of the Creator. Their emanations come from a monadic plane of awareness, which I've outlined in the tutorial on the seven planes or bodies of man. It could be said that these seven great living energies are together the etheric vehicle of the planetary Logos. There are three major rays of aspect and four minor rays of attribute. The first ray is of will, purpose and power. The will of the Logos, the opener of the door. This ray embodies the dynamic idea of the Logos and as the Most High starts the work of creation. The second ray is of love wisdom, the love of the Logos, the light bringer. This ray is the master builder, providing the blueprints with which all form is constructed. The third ray is of activity, adaptability, active intelligence, the mind of the Logos, the keeper of the records and the dispenser of time. This ray constitutes the sum total of the active building forces and the great architect who organizes the materials and starts the work of construction. These three great rays constitute the sum total of divine manifestation. They are the expression of the creative purpose, the synthesis of life, and are active in every form 
in every kingdom in manifestation. The work of the four minor rays, with no concept of being lesser or greater, is to elaborate and differentiate the qualities of life and so produce the infinite multiplicity of forms which will enable life to assume its many points of focus and express its diverse characteristics. The fourth ray is of harmony, beauty, expression and unity. It is the dweller on the threshold, the divine intermediary. Here duality comes into play, harmony through conflict. As the fourth plane is where soulmates are torn apart and reunited, so are all polarities divided and united in the fourth ray. It is also the ray of colour. It is the artist whose colour is always perfect, the musician of melodic genius. It is the ray which teaches the art of living in order to produce a synthesis of beauty. The fifth ray is of concrete knowledge, science and active intelligence. It is the crystallizer of forms, the ray of theory, truth and lucid fact. It is the brilliant surgeon and scientist, the precise chemist and the first rate engineer. This fifth ray works primarily through the third or mental plane of existence and concerns itself with the utilization of matter, the embodying of ideas, and finding the ultimate conclusion. The sixth ray is of abstract idealism or devotion. The visioner of reality. This ray is the man of faith who must have an incarnation of deity to adore. All religious wars have originated from the sixth ray. It is the martyr, the saint, and the bigot, who will lay down his life for the objects of his devotion, but not lift a finger to help those outside his sympathies. It is the great poet of peace, the idealist, the revolutionary, and all paths that require great devotion and faith. This ray is passing out of primary influence at this time. The seventh ray is of ceremonial magic or law, the key to the mystery. This is the ceremonial ray, that which makes man delight in all things done decently and in good order. This is the ray of the high priest, the court chamberlain, the general and nurse, all those who are careful in the smallest detail, the sculptor, genius artist, ultra-polished literary writer who thinks more of the manner than of the matter of his work. It can also manifest as the naysayer, doomsday prophet and cult leader. It is also the ray of the magician who has learnt to exert his influence over his reality. He who knows that everything is relative to the observer it is the ray most prevalent at this present time. There are clear connections between the seven rays, the seven planes of existence and the seven chakras of the human body. But that's the subject of another video or left to your own investigation. If you would like to know more about the seven rays then I recommend you read The Seven Rays of Life by Alice A. Bailey. So where did this book venture? Again, all over the place. We were on um, the new planet, Kyla. We were also on Gaia, on Earth. 
Um, we ventured back to Atlantis, to, to the, the demise of Atlantis this time rather than the Golden Age. So it was all about, yeah, the fall of Atlantis. Um, where else? We went to Shambhala, kind of um, astral realms of that place where we have a gathering of masters. So um, where it was kind of like the regrouping point for the Gr Grigori, which comes up again once we get into the Triad of Being series. So um, I think that's everywhere we went in, in this book. Other world, of course, we're always in and out of there. Um, out of space, inner space, you know, everywhere. My characters will go anywhere. Um, so yeah, that's where this book venture. So that brings us to the audio excerpt. So, um, so far in this vlog, we've covered um, the ode to the, or the prayer to the four winds, and we've looked at the seven rays, and now the audio excerpt is going to look at the four implements for um, summoning, uh, in this case, Mahord, which, but, you know, in our pagan terms, they're used for summoning anything, really. Um, uh, so we've seen, like, Tori use four implements to uh, summon the pan ray, for example. But um, in this case, it's um, one of the bad guys wanting to bring back one of the bad guys. Uh, girls. People. Entities. Yeah. So, without any further ado, here is the audio excerpt. Thank you to Belinda Audio for letting me use it. Um, it was written by myself and... Uh, narrated by Benedict Hardy. Enjoy. The occult was thriving in early 21st century Gaia, and thus it would be the perfect era to raise Mahord from the subplanes. Assuming a human form, Viper went shopping in London. With so many antique dealers and stores that dealt in esoteric tools scattered about the city, Viper had no trouble in acquiring the four implements needed to summon Mahord back to the physical world. A cauldron, a sword, a dark crystal, and a wand. According to Mahord's legend, the tools used for her summons did not have to be those that the crone had collected herself. Mahord's own collection of occult implements had been buried by Maelgwn Gwyneth soon after he defeated Cadfer. The evil tools were then found and used by the Saxon warlord Ossa, and were disposed of completely by Maelgwn's son, Rune, a quarter of a century later. But Mahord's spirit was not banished back to her realm of origin after the Cadfer debacle, and the crone had made an appearance in Gwyneth fifteen years after Maelgwn had buried her equipment, making herself at home in Powys, in the service of Chiglas. This was an oversight that Myrthin corrected, with the help of Gwyn Afneath, when the crone followed Maelgwn and Tori to the late 20th century. However, the implements to be used for the crone's summons were all required to have served a dark purpose in the past. The sword must have drawn human blood. The stone must have been used for dark ritual or purpose in the past. The cauldron must have boiled the blood of the living. The wand must be crafted from a twig off a branch used to burn a living thing to death. Viper avoided paying for any of his acquisitions, by simply willing an item he desired back to the A-10. And when he returned to view his bounty, he felt very pleased with his efforts. He'd managed to find a large, double-terminated, smoky quartz crystal hanging from a chain which had cursed all who had ever had the misfortune of wearing it. All its victims had died whilst wearing the stone. The legend went that with each death, the stone had turned darker. Now it was almost pitch black. 
The cauldron he found had known a dark history with a child abductor, whose sick obsessions made the large iron pot very specific to Viper's requirements. The fellow who was showing Viper the sword was unable to assure him that it had drawn human blood, so the pirate ran the salesman through just to be on the safe side. Viper then hunted down a feral cat, made a bonfire and burned the animal alive, and snapping a twig from the branch to which the cat was secured, he acquired the last of his tools. So that would be just about it for this vlog. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it insightful. Um, for those of you that haven't seen the uh, channel schedule, um, I will hopefully be getting up the next book vlog in January. And if I do, it will be the Alchemist Key as requested by you. Uh, beyond that, I'll be getting, I'll put up a poll and get you guys to vote whether we go back into the trilogies or do more standalones. Um, I just want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a sensational New Year. I hope it's all just magical and that you have a wonderful time and stay very safe and um, spend it with people you love. I will see you in the new year. Thank you so much for watching and supporting this channel. Like, sharing and subscribing. All my connections are below if you want a mentor session or a reading or anything with me. You'll find all the links below. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye.